All right. Uh, after uh, we're going to talk about scaling security and agile scrum today. Hopefully, you guys can hear me in the back. If not, just kind of raise your hand or something. So, over the past few years, there's been a major increase in the use of agile methodology. And that shift has made it more challenging for security teams to keep up, um, especially when you compare it to traditional models like waterfall. Uh, agile means increased speed and uh, lower latency, which leads to some resource constraints on the part of security teams. The risk of shipping into your product is elevated because suddenly you're not able to, to inspect thoroughly enough. And the good news is that security can work within Agile. It can be done well, it can be done without having to allocate a lot of full-time security experts to development teams, which is great. It does require some flexibility on your part. So this is kind of a case study. And as I go through this case study, what I'd like you to do is to listen to how our process has evolved. This is all based on things that we do internally at Verica. And then envision how you could maybe apply some of our learnings to your own Agile Dev teams back at home. My hope is that you'll take away three things from this. Number one, learn from our successes and mistakes. Number two, improve your ability to ship secure software developed within Agile frameworks. And number three, make your relationship with dev teams uh, less adversarial and more of a partnership. So by way of introduction, uh, my name is Chris A. I lead the research team at Veracode. Uh, I'm responsible for building security knowledge into our products. And I also share accountability for product security with our CISO. I spent most of the first part of my career uh, doing offense, so pen testing and breaking stuff, uh, before coming to Verico to focus uh, more on the defensive side. So uh, when developers switch us to Agile, a lot of times what happens is security teams get left behind. You may not realize, if you're not closely uh, intertwined with your dev teams, you may not realize that the reason you're getting strong. Uh, you may just get a product increment at some point that they want to release and they say, hey, can you test this before we release? So if you don't adjust and understand how the development process works, it can be very difficult for you uh, to stay up to date with what's going on. There's an information week survey that was released about a month ago. It's called the App Dev Priority Survey. And uh, they surveyed about 530 organizations about how they're doing various you know, different parts of their development uh, process. And one of them asked about Agile. And so currently, they found that 69% of organizations are using Agile, and another 13% plan to implement some form of Agile within the next 12 to 24 months. So you, know, you can add that together and figure out that that's mostly all of them. So everyone is doing Agile, just about, to some extent. Whether it's full-on Agile Scrum or just kind of Agile-like methodologies, it's close enough. In the same survey, 76% of companies said that Agile either slightly or majorly improves their development timelines. So it makes them more productive, it makes them work faster, more effectively, and so you can see that's why they're motivated to do that from a development point of view. And from a security point of view, there are a couple models out there that suggest how to do security within Agile, but they're kind of generic. If you Google it, you'll find one from Microsoft, it says security in the Agile SDL. And it's a good start, but the problem with it and any sort of best practices methodology is that it's a generic approach that makes some assumptions about your security resourcing, the expertise on your team, kind of assumes that you have unlimited resources, uh, bandwidth, it glosses over a lot of real world uh, complexities, for example, having multiple scrum teams working on a single product, which is fairly common, it doesn't really talk about that very much. So that's why I thought it was important to just to approach this topic from the perspective of a case study. So we have all this kind of real world, here are the actual things that we ran into as we were trying to do this, you know, starting from a generic model. So I'm going to walk you through how our SDL has evolved over the past three to four years uh, since we made the move to Agile Scrum. I'll go through a few phases about some things that we tried and that didn't work for various reasons, just to get out of context for that. And then uh, we'll talk about how we're Currently, over the past year, we scaled that out, um, made that uh, something that gets pushed down into the individual, individual scrum teams themselves using a program that we call the Security Champions. And I'll end with a discussion of challenges and future direction and some, some specific takeaways and learnings that will hopefully will be, be useful to you. It's really weird for me standing in one place. Like, normally I'd be wondering, but like, standing here. Anyway, um, so several years ago, 
uh, about four years ago now at Verico, we decided to start using Agile Scrum. And from early on in the company, you know, we were said we were using Agile, but we really weren't. We, you know, we would write user stories, but our sprints would be anywhere from six to twelve weeks. We would miss release dates by like a month at a time, and we're not. This is not a Scrum. So there were a few reasons why we decided, all right, we need to go full on, we need to actually do this for real. So we were at a stage in the company where we were evolving from a single product uh, to a multi-product, uh, single team to multi-team, single site to multi-site. So we needed to become more scalable, we needed to become more predictable and, and more mature as an organization. And also we liked the notion of continuous learning that comes with Agile, that you're constantly reevaluating, and assessing what you're doing, what's going well, what's going poorly, and where you can improve. And we like that. Uh, we were in a period of aggressive growth, hiring lots of engineers, and uh, one of the nice things about using Scrum is it's a well-defined methodology for building software. And so when we would bring lots of new developers on from other, you know, other companies, we, sure, we'd have to ramp them up on our product, but we didn't have to ramp them up on how we built software. They already knew how Scrum works, if we hired correctly, obviously. So they understand the processes and the, the operational stuff, and they just needed to ramp up on, on, on the project. Um, you know, the last thing I want to point out in terms of the motivation to move to Scrum is it was completely driven by development teams, right? There was no regard for, like, oh, should we move to Scrum? Does it affect security at all? You know, may maybe they won't like that. No, but of course, of course not. So it's not meant to be pointed out as a negative so much as it's an observation. Security teams have to adapt to the way the business wanted to build software. It wasn't necessary for them to ask us what we thought about it. That's our responsibility to learn it and, and understand how it would affect us. But purely driven by development methodology. Okay, so uh, just a quick show of hands. Who uses Agile Scrum today? Okay, we've got about half, that's pretty typical. Uh, developers in the room? Okay, uh, a little bit more than average. Okay, so I don't want to give you all the background on Agile, Agile Scrum. You can go read that on your own. I am going to use a few terms throughout, so I'm going to very quickly define just the very basics of what you need to know uh, so, I can, so I can talk about what we're doing in, in some depth. So a few definitions, I'll sprinkle them throughout. First thing, Scrum ceremonies. All right, so you'll see different icons through the slides that kind of represent different parts of Scrum, right? So the card represents the sprint planning process. And that's where you kind of have a meeting, you define the work to be done during the sprint, the team chooses how much work it can, it can commit to, and you go from there. So every iteration, you do a planning cycle. The calendar represents the daily Scrum, which is when you go and you use get together in a room with people, you stand up, you talk about, you know, what you do, you know, what did you do yesterday, what am I going to do today, where am I blocked, and can we swim on something. So that's a daily scrum meeting. The review demo meeting is when at the end of a sprint, you get together, you say, hey, here's all the cool stuff we've done, then you show off what I've done in my user stories, uh, and you just, you know, you show, you evaluate the changes that you've made to the product during that time frame. And finally, the retro is a point where you, as a team, get together, you reflect on the process, and you think about or what went well this sprint, uh, what went poorly, and what can we improve on. Sometimes the review and the demo and the retro are combined into a single meeting. These meetings are not supposed to last a long time. A, a review is supposed to be an hour max, and the retro is supposed to be about you know, 45 minutes per week of sprint. Um, so you know, these are short. these are short things. So this happens every sprint, and sprint is the iteration, the, the cycle, the, the unit of measure for our first run. All right, so when we first started, like, okay, we're moving to Agile Scrum, what should we do? So the first thing we did was like, well, crap, we need to know what is going on in development. We need to, we need to understand what stories they're building, what they're taking in, what they're committing to, so that we know what needs to be tested, right? Pretty simple. We can't just wait till the end and say, all right, let's just do a pen test. We needed to look at the individual stories that they were committing to, and figuring out, all right, does this need a code review? Does this need a design consultation with the security expert? Does this need a little miniature pen test for this particular feature that's like super important and has you know, security critical functionality? So what we do is uh, we just started going to their planning meeting. So every, um, for this particular team, it was every two weeks, they'd have a two hour planning meeting where they would go through, they'd pull stuff into that particular sprint and that was what they would, code up for that sprint. 
So we would sit there and we would listen and say, oh, that sounds like it's security related or that doesn't sound like it's security related and just kind of make, make a note of what needed to be added to that particular story. So adding a new GSP page, somebody might say, all right, we need to take a photo view of that and we need to make sure that the developer understands what process we're doing. Like, so very informal. Um, we didn't create stories for that. We just, we just kind of kept track of what needed to be done where and then we like, tap the developer on the shoulder and said, hey, you know, when you're done with that, let me know. So, you know, pretty, pretty informal at this point. Now I'm going to evaluate what we were doing in the style that you would do in a retro. So during this kind of phase in our life cycle, here's what was, here's what was working. So we had increased visibility. We knew what stories were going in. We were aware of more stuff. Um, we had security subject matter experts uh, reviewing the results of automated scans, which seems obvious, but up until then, we were using our own products and other products to, to do scanning. Uh, of the product, but the developers were reviewing the results and making the fixes, and so we said, well, you know, we should probably get a loop on that. This is a long time ago. And then we were more closely aligned with the developers' life cycle, you know, working with them in their sprints. Was there a question there? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, how, how big is the team in my team or the team? So my team specifically is, is eight researchers, and we're mostly, but keep in mind that we're responsible for building functionality in the product. We're not, nobody was hired to work on product security. So basically at this point we were working with, you know, like a quarter of one person to, you know, to, to do the stuff that we were doing in this space. What was bad for us here is that we were not using that particular time very efficiently. So I mentioned, you know, he's sitting there in this two hour meeting just kind of listening, his ears perking up when there was something that we needed to do. Uh, but, you know, you might sit there for 30 minutes listening to stories that have nothing to do with security. It's like, what a waste of time. Um, so what we thought we needed to change here was like, how do we figure out how to use time more efficiently? How do we, you know, drop you in exactly how we need you and not have you sitting here listening to stuff that doesn't really matter to, reach to, to security? Okay, more definitions. So, um, in Scrum, you have a thing called a product backlog, and that represents all development stories for a given product, all the stuff that you're eventually going to build or that you had an idea to build. Um, the idea is that this rank in priority, so it's groomed in terms of what's most important. So that's why at the top of the bookshelf, you've got things like nice orderly fashion. As you move towards the bottom, you have things kind of haphazard. They may, have, they may not have been prioritized yet. But you have this list, this world of user stories that correspond to what you're going to eventually build. Your sprint backlog, which is this little pile of books here, is the stories the team is committed to uh, completing during a sprint. So during that two-week period, this is the chunk of work that we've bitten off that we're going to do. And then finally, the product increment, the stuff in the box, is what's shippable at the end of the sprint. So by scrum definitions, at the end of every sprint, you're supposed to have a shippable product. That's, that's it. You have to have acceptance criteria. You have to have a definition of done, but your product should be shipped. Okay, so as we're going from this first phase where we're kind of just sitting there wasting a lot of time and identifying what we should be working on, uh, in the meantime, the development teams did a few things to us that we didn't um, account for. Um, number one, they took one huge scrum team, they split it into three scrum teams. Great. So that's, on the surface, three times more meetings. Not great. Uh, they did that because they weren't adhering to scrum rules, which says that you have to be seven plus or minus two people for a scrum team, and at this point they were like, you know, 18, 20 people in the scrum team. So that wasn't correct. Um, so they um, they split the different scrum teams. Uh, I think this is around the point where we also actually added. Um, we were switching uh, technology stacks from like Rally to Jira. We were doing a bunch of things that just like created a lot of hassle. Um, we just had to kind of be aware of that and roll with that. Okay, so um, in phase two, now you can see we've got three different Scrum teams for this particular part of the product, right? And we're trying to use our time more effectively. So what we started doing is we said, let's not sit in on that planning meeting. That's too much time. Let's meet with the tech lead for that particular Scrum team, uh, which could be the Scrum master, could be the dev lead. There's not a strict definition there. Let's meet with them afterwards 
and just go through all the stuff that they committed to, like really quickly. We'll just go down the list, and like bam, bam, bam. If there's clearly no security impact, we'll just not talk about it. We don't need to know what it was designed for, what the customer need is. If there's not a security impact, we'll just skip over it. And so what that led to is like, we could get through all this in like 20 or 30 minutes instead of two hours. Downside is we had to do it for um, three different teams now. But still, we were, we were coming out ahead, we were using our time better, and we were actually um, creating real stories in Jira and attaching them to the main, the main stories. We were creating essentially a subtask, attaching it to the story, and that way you couldn't close out the story until you just also close out the security subtask. The subtask would be do a static analysis, it could be do a code review, a code review, so I don't know if you can see that, but you know, when you've done a code review, it kind of knows why it's a prime face. Um, and it could be anything, it could be any sort of security activity. And, uh, and that, that tied it much better into the way that they were using the tools, and, um, you know, and they already knew, the dev teams already know if you don't close out a story unless you finish all the subtasks. Right? So that was good. In this phase, we're like, all right, cool. Uh, more effective use of, uh, of our researchers' time. Uh, developers were starting to kind of get it. They were kind of um, reaching out to us with questions, which was nice. Um, and then, you know, there was a flexibility issue. We, we were able to continue um, working with the dev teams during this period of change. Like I mentioned, the team split, the tool split, um, things that were changing from a development perspective. We were able to continue uh, you know, helping out those teams and staying integrated. What was that? Okay, well, obviously because the team split, I mentioned there was an increased time commitment that we had. So, you know, multiply everything by three, even though we were decreasing the, you know, the commitment to each team. Um, we were violating Scrum still by changing stories during the sprint. So, if, the, if we go back and, and describe again what we were doing, the Scrum team would meet on their own, they do their planning, they take in their work, and then we would meet with them afterwards, figure out which things needed security work, and add work to each story, which is a big number, like in Scrum. If you don't change the amount of, now we weren't adding work for them, we were adding work for us, so sort of okay, but still you're not supposed to do that. Um, so that was bad. And then also at this point, we created a sort of a single point of failure by virtue of the fact that I had one person that I had kind of designated to go to all these memes and do the security tasking and do the reviews, and you know, uh, that made it hard for him to go on vacation. So what do we need to change? Uh, we need to move uh, earlier in the pre-sprint planning act activities into the grooming phase so that we weren't adding work after the sprint. Um, and then also we needed to find a way to distribute the workload among the other people in the team so that we didn't have a single point of failure. Um, another thing that was worth pointing out here, I, I can't remember exactly when this happened, so I didn't put it on the slide, but uh, at one point, uh, the development organization uh, had some training company come in to do Scrum Master training for all the, and we had probably about 10 different Scrum teams at this point, I'm only focusing on a subset of that here. But they said, all right, we're going to send all these developers to Scrum Master training so they know, you know exactly how the thing works and they speak in the same language. So I sent two people from the security team to that as well. Because, like, why not? You learn the vocabulary, you learn how, you know, the sausage is made. Um, you're on the same page with the engineers. And, you know, that can't hurt. And it costs two days of their time, so. And I got certified. Okay, more definitions, fun. Uh, in Scrum, you have a couple different roles. You have product owner. Uh, you can tell he's a product owner because he's one of the soup. He is responsible, or she is responsible for prioritization. Uh, that person has a single interface to stakeholders. Stakeholders can be management, can be customers, all the people asking for stuff. Hey, build me this feature, build me this you know, capability. Product owner does that. And says, what's important? You know, what can I hold off three quarters on? You know, what is going to make me lose a customer if I don't do it today? That sort of thing. The Scrum Master uh, has, a very, has an internal focus on the team and the process. Uh, it's not allowed for the product owner and the Scrum Master to be the same person. The Scrum Master is like running, you know, is making sure the train is run on time, calling the meetings, making sure you know people don't go into rat holes, just kind of <coughs> cracking the whip. And the team is everyone else. Everyone else in the Scrum team is doing the work. This can be developers, uh, QA testers, DBAs, uh, UX people. Uh, it's self-organizing. It can be seven people plus or minus two, which I mentioned before. But other than that, 
It's going to be it can be kind of comprised of anybody that is doing work that's going towards the product. So um, after Ryan, uh, my product security guy, uh, went to Scrum Master training, he came back and said, "Hey, you know, we actually have very similar roles to this on the security team. If you think about the things that we do, a product owner is on the Scrum side is sort of." The same thing as a, our security architect, which is the person that's strategic, they're closely involved in the, the planning, they're the one that's kind of saying like where security activities needed to be added and looking at the backlog. The team member on the Scrum team is very similar to what we would call a security engineer, um, for lack of a better word. Uh, and that sort of person is more tactical, they're not tightly coupled with any particular team. They take little chunks of work like, hey, code review this page or go consult with uh, this developer on how to do crypto correctly, but they're taking very tactical pieces of work in the same way that a Scrum team member takes a story in. Um, so uh, we started, um, we just kind of designated everybody on the team as like, hey, you're like, you know, 5% security engineer and you're going to start taking these little bits of work that are doled out to you by um, our security architect who's kind of, you know, um, running the show and kind of doling out the work and figuring out, making sure that we know uh, that, that we're doing the right things. <coughs> uh, so this takes us to phase three. So we said we were moving earlier in the life cycle. So what we did is we had the security architect sit with the product owner uh, every couple weeks. And what they would do is they would boom the backlog. So the backlog, if you remember, is stories that haven't been taken in yet. Stuff that's prioritized that you're, we're going to build eventually and will take will get taken in two sprints as you go. So the security architect sits there with the product owner, they groom starting from the top of the prioritized backlog down, however well they feel is, is about one sprint's worth or maybe a little bit more, maybe one and a half sprint's worth because things get shuffled. And they would just do the same thing as they had previously done post-planning. Go through, look at the story, what is this? Does it have a security impact? What would that security impact be? What tasks should I add onto this? Um, so that when we build it, we should make sure that, that, we, um, that we carry out from a security perspective. And we would create those subtasks and attach them to the story at that time. So now, when the Scrum team goes into their planning session, they're taking in stories that have already been groomed and prioritized from a feature perspective, and also groomed and subtasked from a security perspective. So now, the amount of work you're taking in is known, uh, the amount of work that's going to impact the security team is known, and we're actually doing things according to Scrum rules. So that was um, that was a, a good improvement for us. So now you have coming out of a sprint planning meeting, you've got each of these stories. Some of them have security tasks, some of them don't, and then individual developers are interacting with individual security engineers to work on that particular console or that review, and then eventually you get to your, your product improvement. I would say it's three. So that takes us to about like two years ago. What was good? Well, we were at a more influential point to inject security. Uh, we were better involved in design discussions. We had a more uh, accurate view of the sizing and the scoping of stories. We had better visibility to tracking. So we had a release board that we could look at and kind of see exactly what, the brewing, um, what came out of brewing. And we were starting to become scalable finally by distributing the tactical work amongst the team. Uh, the bad was that, yes, we did have more people involved, but that creates complexity, and complexity always, you know, it's worth mentioning as a bad. Um, we thought we could do better training at this point, and uh, of, the, of the individual dev teams themselves, so we were doing a lot of work for them, but they weren't learning a lot from it, unless, you know, they made mistakes and then they might learn a little bit about that particular thing, but we weren't really putting an effort into training them beyond that, so we thought, well, we should figure out how to do that. And then we were thinking, well, we need to figure out how to incorporate or internalize security testing along with the existing QA testing, which is sort of, you know, depending on the organization, can be kind of a pipe dream, but, um, you know, varying degrees of difficulty. There's a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's worth mentioning before we get into what I'm going to call phase four, which is the current phase. This part's a little bit engineering heavy and less security specific, but it's an important aspect of how we improve our processes, and uh, that's why I included it. So the context here is that a lot of companies don't use their own products very well, very much, or as actively as they ask 
their customers to use their products, which is kind of silly. And what happens when you do that is you end up lacking empathy for your customers' pain points. And your solutions that you come up with for those pain points may miss the mark because you haven't experienced it yourself, right? You're just listening to how somebody else is having trouble, and you're like, oh, I think I, I, think I can solve that by you know, tweaking this, this UI here. But you haven't tried to use it yourself, so you get it wrong. So um, we were using our own stuff, but we weren't using it enough. And at the beginning of the year, last year, we said we should do a better job of this. We should put ourselves in our customer's shoes in terms of how do we incorporate our stuff into automated workflows. So we were doing that, but we weren't doing it that well. So we call this project Purina. If you haven't figured it out, it's pretty obvious, but so eat your own dog food, obviously. Um, and so what we focused on was better, more effective use of our APIs and our technology integration to do automated static and dynamic scanning of code, the code that we were building. The scanning is the product that we sell, by the way. I didn't mention that, but that's, what we, that's our business. So go scan. Uh, anyway. So here's how we incorporate automated security testing. Before we got into this product Purina thing, here's what we did. So we get a release candidate ready. Someone would log into Jenkins and kick off the build, or however you kick off builds in Jenkins. You had to, we have to build the code slightly differently for our analysis. So they would have to, I don't know, go press a button and kick something. When the build is complete, they would go download the jar or the war files from wherever Jenkins, and then they would upload, so log into a very good website, upload it, configure the bill, run the, the pre-scan, checks for dependencies and a bunch of things. That takes a little while, so they go you know, get a cup of coffee or something. Mm -hmm. Once pre-scan is complete, then they have to go select the modules that they wanted to, to scan, because you can you know, do you can do partial scans if you want. They have to click run button, and then they have to wait, you know, for some more coffee or you know, that, that would vary from you know, 10 minutes to a few hours. But, and then when the scan completes, they would go log in again to the platform. They'd have to log in because, of course, they'd be timed out by then. And they'd view the results manually and kind of click through them. And then if there were issues that needed to be fixed, go manually create you know, Jira tickets and it was ugly. So that's at least three or four steps that required manual intervention. And more importantly, they, include, they, they, they introduced a lot of latency. So over the period of a few months, what we did was we replaced every single one of those manual steps with automation um, using, uh, using various plugins and APIs. And you know, you'd think that we would have been using those all along, except that not all of them actually existed when we started doing this. So today we use a Jenkins plugin to uh, interface with the APIs, uh, perform the upload, configuration, and scan, kick off automatically with a single click. Uh, developers don't have to log into the website anymore to view results. We have a Jira plugin which actually pulls down all the bugs that we find automatically into Jira, right alongside all the other bugs they're working on, labels them with security and a CWE label, but basically they're just bugs. And bugs are bugs. Security bugs are bugs. Uh, the only important things that they're required to fix by virtue of the policies that we've set, so um, you know, why import something you're not going to fix? Um, they have to fix most of that. But, um, so now that's, that just happens, and the work, the security work that they have to do just shows up alongside all the other stuff that can be prioritized along with the features. You know, we can say that something is critical in the same way that we could before, except now that it's, now it's just there. Another thing that we Im improved during this phase was um, we started using, heavily using a feature of our platform called Sandboxing, which is like, it lets a developer run a scan in isolation. It's kind of like, a, a, I don't know, open book test. In a way, so they're not doing it officially. It's not you know the team. The rest of the team doesn't see it. Only they see it, so they can find issues earlier on. They can fix them, and I don't know, not have any anxiety around you know what are the scans going to find when I check this in. What's going to show up in the release candidate? Which you know, which is um, I guess gives them a level of comfort. Uh, the good thing from our perspective, from a security perspective, is now things are getting fixed earlier and earlier in the dev cycle as they're doing the sandbox approach. So when we get to the release candidate, there's actually fewer bugs to fix. We're finding stuff earlier, we're fixing stuff earlier, and many you know, manual steps are now replaced with automated steps. And ultimately, we're able to, to do this much more efficiently, which is important as you work towards you know, a, a CI, CD sort of model, which we're not at today. We're doing you know, 
couple weeks sprints, but eventually, you know, you want to be releasing more and more often. So automation was key there. So, yeah, question. That's great. So the question is, from Sandbox perspective, is it that we're not capturing <laughs> metrics about it? Yeah, that, so flaws that we find there um, are only developers can see those and they can fix them. And that way the business doesn't have to have to see them. And, you know, we think that's fair. I mean, if they can fix it beforehand, like why do they need to be dinged for that? Not that they get dinged anyway, but that it gives them a level of comfort. Like developers really like the sandboxing. They, they do. Okay, so the last phase that we're in now, and this is kind of 2014. So like, how do we scale this thing? How do we, you know, um, how do we take what we're doing on our team and like make other people do that so that we can focus on more strategic long-term things? Um, how do we build security experts within the organization? And um, you know, our team has grown at the same rate that the company has grown or the, at the rate that the engineering organization has grown. So our team was starting to get a little bit stretched. We realized at this point that the culture was right to, to scale uh, security expertise beyond the team. And what we thought was, all right, let's find some volunteers on each team to be like a security, you know, we didn't have a name yet, but we said security ambassador, security champion, someone who is a developer that wants to learn more about security, add it to their resume, take some additional accountability, learn some skills, and just, you know, they're interested in doing it. So there were no prereqs to volunteering other than you had to have an interest in the topic. And we were asking you for maybe a couple extra hours a week, uh, no more than that, like specifically limited to that because we wanted people to actually raise their hands and sign up. So the goals of this program initially were, um, number one, of course, scale the SDLC by embedding security into each team rather than having it be an externality, having it you know, be on, on the security research team, which is not embedded. Um, having those people will be the conscience, the security conscience. So as they're working in their stand-ups or working with their teams, to be thinking kind of all the time, what would, you know, what would Chris think about this? Or what would you know, Ryan think about this? Because we're not always there. And it's good to have somebody asking those questions all the time. Uh, the program would provide opportunities for collaboration between research and engineering on new security initiatives. And it would encourage uh, the teaching and learning aspect that I said before was, was underrepresented. So it would give us more opportunity to, to teach security skills as part of company culture. Uh, so this is not the sort of thing that you just uh, show up to work and send an email out about and say, hey, we're doing this now. Uh, we spent a while socializing the concept with every single engineering manager and engineering lead. Because we're going to be asking for their time, the developer's time, right? You don't just take two hours of someone's time, someone's time per week, um, and not let the, the engineering manager know. So we socialize it with, you know, the VPs and the tech leads and a lot of people. And then we put out an email asking for volunteers and describe what we were asking for. Um, I had a bet with one of the development leads because I said we're not going to have a lot of trouble. People are not going to sign up for this. This is going to be really tough. And he's like, No, no, everyone's going to sign up for this. Uh, he was right, we had about somewhere between 15 and 20 people sign up with far exceeded expectations. We took all of them, because why not? Uh, it's good to have a little redundancy. Uh, especially because scrum teams, as I mentioned, can reform all the time. They can, you know, so just because you have one person per team, if they decide to move to a different team, now you're, now you're kind of out of balance. So we took them all. First quarter goal was exposure to our world. Like, hey, here's what we do with security people. Uh, and just some general education. So we sent them all to a local security conference. It was pretty cheap. Kind of immersed them in the world, having intense and technical talks, just kind of hear about the you know, attack and defense and the types of issues that we deal with. Uh, we didn't give them any particular agenda. We just said, go, just go to stuff that sounds interesting, come back, and uh, we're all going to convene, and everyone's going to do a five minute version of your favorite talk. So um, that was a good way to kick it off and uh, have people internalize at least you know, the content of one talk and then come back and share that. So that was fun. Then we also said, all right, security champion, you're attending every security grooming meeting that, that we do. So you don't have to do anything yet. Just show up, listen to, you know, the security architect, talk to, um, talk to the product owner, listen to the questions that they're asking, 
the things that they're poking them on. Uh, what is it that you know makes it so that you have to do a design review? What are those things? What are those criteria, those triggers? So they just would need to listen. Um, and then um, the other thing that we did to kind of keep people engaged in a way that was not too much of a commitment was we set up some drop-in times each week where uh, we just have kind of a communal kitchen. So we said, hey, um, it started out just twice a week for like two hours, just drop-in time. Come whenever you want. We're going to work on public CTS as a group. So there were a lot of them, it turned out, not just the conferences, but at the time there was one called Hacky Easter. It was in April. And uh, you know, there were just like 30 different challenges that you could do, very short, just as CTFs tend to be, uh, ranging from asset to network security to reversing to crypto, whatever you want. So not just web app. So. The point is, they could come for two hours, they could come for 30 minutes, they could come twice a week or not at all. No commitment and you know, no prerequisite learning from one week to the next. But they could come down, they could sit there, work with their peers, have um, a couple security people to ask questions to as they struggled, and um, it went really well. We had a lot of people show up to those, interestingly, not just the security champions, but just like other random people from the company would just start showing up to these. Uh, we have a whole services team that you know, is kind of the front you know, customer-facing arm of the, of the company. And we have some of them show up. Sales engineers show up. Um, Analysts, like, it's really fun. So it's not huge high volume every time, but we have we have some regulars, but some people just drop in for 30 minutes, and that's exactly what it's designed to be. Um, so that has been that's been a lot more um, popular than, than I think we ever thought it would be. Then Q3 and Q4, we gave them actual goals. We we gave them things that they actually needed to do, and we worked with their managers to actually put that, to actually goal them with that in terms of their. Um, an annual review. So they had, you know, they had their normal engineering goals, and then they had a security champion goal. And as we're going through the annual performance review process now, they're actually being measured against that whether they achieved those. So that's cool. And again, they had to be socialized with the managers to do that. In Q3, they were tasked with taking over just the, you know, clicking and the typing of creating the security subtasks that we associated with each story. So now they weren't just listening; they were the one that actually had to listen and. Um, you know, create the Jira stuff. We still have the research person there as a, as, a, as a safety blanket in case they didn't know all the answers, which they didn't, but they were the ones getting kind of the muscle memory of how to do this and when to do it. By the end of Q4, we wanted to set them loose on the grooming themselves so they would be able to do all the security grooming meetings without the security person in the room at all. And the way they were able to do that was we asked each of them to go back and look at all the security subtasks over the past year and look for the patterns. What, why did these 18 stories need code reviews? Oh, well, it's, here's the common thread. And we asked them to do that because it was different for every team that we worked with. There's no, there's no generic list. I can't give you a list that says, here are the things that you would look for during Groovy because it's very specific to the product. So we asked them to do that. They all came up with a checklist. And now, um, with the exception of, I think, one team, they're all um, security champions are doing their own grooming, and we can focus on other things. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's where we are kind of at this point. We're in the process of building goals for them for the coming year, which are going to include things like uh, ramping up on doing some of the some of the review work themselves. Um, the code reviews can, to some extent, be turned into checklists if they understand a little bit of context. Um, and uh, basically working on some of the tasks that we would typically do with our guidance, with the, with the end goal being let's turn, a to, uh, let's turn over a lot of that stuff to them uh, by the end of the year. And we haven't set those quarterly milestones yet, but we're in the process of doing that. The thing that I thought was interesting, I just wrote a note here. Um, if you remember back in September, there was this announcement at Microsoft saying that they were, you know, they were basically disbanding trustworthy computing and there was everybody just had a connection over that because of the way that it was being reported. Um, and really what it was, if you think about it, is they just said, we're going to take this group of people, which was you know, previously a centralized team, and we're going to push the expertise down into the various product teams, which sounds very much like security champions, except for the fact that you're taking existing security experts and you're pushing them down as opposed to taking developers and growing them into security experts. But the idea that you have that 
embedded security expertise on the team is, to me, what it sounds like they're doing. Um, so I thought that was interesting because as we were going through this exercise during the year, they, they kind of were having the same, um, same epiphany, I guess. And I don't know if that was because of Scrum or it was just because of a, a move to, to more frequent releases, but it was, it was interesting nonetheless. All right, so we'll do challenges in the future and stuff like that. So there have been a lot of challenges along the way. This hasn't been completely rosy. I mean, it's compressed about several years worth now into you know, 40 minutes. Um, at the beginning, it was really difficult to get some of the newer Scrum teams, especially, to take the process seriously. Um, we're a security company, but we're also still you know, uh, a company full of engineers that don't always come from security backgrounds. So, um, you think it would be maybe easy, but it's it's not. They're not used to that. So that was a little tough. Um, early on, there was some rogue development work. Uh, and by rogue, I don't mean malicious. I just mean sometimes developers would take it upon themselves to do work that wasn't, um, that hadn't been taken into the sprint. Basically, they're overachieving. They're raiding the backlog and doing stuff before it was, before it was meant to be done. And that was pretty cool. Um, except that we didn't have any visibility into it. And so we couldn't review it. So we didn't know that was happening. Uh, we're a lot better at that now. Um, and there's kind of an ongoing battle between scrum rigor and pragmatism. So what I mean by that is you're not supposed to, you know, in a real world, in a perfect world, you're supposed to have people fully committed to the scrum teams. We can't afford to do that. I can't put a security expert on each of you know, 15 different scrum teams, which is why we're building the security champions. But you know, initially, we didn't have that. And we got a little bit of pushback saying like, hey, you should fully commit to this. You should be a member of this team. I'm like, great, I would be happy to put somebody on your team if you want to give me that rec. And nobody gave me the rec. So we had to, you know, we had to ask for some flexibility in, in doing that, and we, we got through it. Um, without getting too much into this because of time, uh, Kanban teams, some teams decided they wanted to work in Kanban with Scrum. That creates a whole set of problems on its own because it doesn't have this the sort of structure um, that, that Scrum does. And in, in particular, this particular team was a sort of a product uh, sustaining or a maintenance team. So it has higher turnover, and assigning a security champion to that is harder because the point is you work on this particular team for a little while, and then you kind of you know, advance uh, onto a more, I don't know, a more product focused team. So this is a challenge we haven't really gotten through yet. Uh, so sure, uh, you know, we're moving towards continuous deployment. Uh, we want to be able to deploy more often than, than monthly, which is what we do now. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to be 50 deploys a day. You know, we're not Etsy, um, nor, nor do we need to be, right? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the sort of things that those companies do and we'll learn from them. But um, I think our customers expect us a level of security rigor from us that's very different from what they would expect from a consumer-specific site. Um, but we're, there's a lot of lessons that we have to learn from there, and we are going to speed up, so we have to figure out how to, how to do that. Um, this year, as we get security champions rolled out, we're going to be building more security libraries internally, so uh, not just code review guidelines, but you know, hey, if you want to do crypto, here's a library to use. Here's the Veracode-specific um, uh, encoding libraries for these various you know, situations that correspond to, you know, user IDs or you know, whatever the case may be for our particular product. And so that will also make it easier for the security champions to take on the code review work because they can just check if, if they're using something that's approved or not. Um, it's not going to completely take away the dependence on a, a strong security team, but I think that um, the checklist style approach gives you a really solid baseline that you can start from. That may cover 80%, and then you know you escalate to you know, the more seasoned experts for the, for the remainder of it. This is yet to be seen. So um, we'll see how that goes. That's kind of where we are right now. And um, by my clock, I have 12 minutes. But by your clock, you were, you gave me a five-minute sign like yeah. three minutes ago. So what's the deal? So I thought, do we not have till four? Oh, okay. Well, good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take I'm going to take a few questions. Okay, I'll take a few questions and then I'll wrap up at the end. So I have some conclusion slides with the actual takeaways. But um, 
Let me take a, a, a few minutes of questions now. Yep. Yeah, that was you. Uh, any tips on uh, so questions on uh, incorporating InfoSec risk management into Scrum. Um, yeah, you know, I would say that the extent that we do that, I mean, we're things are happening at a very tactical level. So we're doing like we're doing like lightweight threat modeling for individual stories and things like that. But but if you talk about you know actual real you know business risk management. Um, that doesn't come into the day-to-day -day so much. I mean, um, I don't know, that may vary from place to place, but we're focused more on what are the individual stories we're building, what are the you know, security risks inherent with that, you know, what do we need to threat model, but, but not, not sort of like leveling up the infosec risk. Yep. So as we, transfer, uh, as we transition responsibility from the security team to the security champions who took ownership of basically of misses, right? Um, we still take ownership of that. We have accountability for that. And we, do, we do some sampling. So even though they're the ones doing it, we'll go and we'll look at the backlog and we'll kind of just take a quick glance to see if we, we see if they missed anything. Also, they know that if they, if they have a question on something, uh, to not just make a guess, I mean, escalate, just, you know, for us it's just like make a phone call or send an email and escalate it to us and we'll help answer that. So there's, um, there's not a, we're not completely, we're not sending them out there with, with no safety net. Um, but yeah, we, we all share accountability. I mean, that's kind of part of Scrum anyway, it's like share accountability for, for everything. Um, so yeah, we still, we still hold on to that, we haven't completely let it go. So, yeah, yeah. So the, their manager is the one that signs, oh sorry, uh, who set the goals and who's responsible for evaluation. Uh, so we set the goals, uh, we communicate to the managers to make sure that they felt that it was um, reasonable. Um, and then as we've gone through evaluation process this year, which we do in January, um, those managers have reached back out to me and the person running product security to, to ask, have they fulfilled, have this, you know, has this person fulfilled these goals? So it's just, you know, we, we can say yes or no, we can give them additional insight. So we're evaluating them, uh, but the manager is the one that kind of you know, selects the value from the top down and goes into the review. So, I mean, the, manager didn't, the manager didn't. Was the manager at? You know, so the manager was. Uh, we gave. We wrote an email saying like, "Here's the Q3 goal and here's the Q4 goal. Can you please put this into success factors for your people that are doing this?" And they did it. So they didn't take anything away, they just added that goal. Uh, they didn't take anything away? No, because it's a small, I mean, it's a couple hour commitment a week. It's not, it wasn't a big deal. They felt it was reasonable. They wouldn't have done it if they said, no, this is, we can't ask people to do this. Like, that's why we socialized it so heavily. Um, they were okay with it. Yep, one more there. You mentioned the uh, integration of online scans and data creation. Uh, how did you handle false positives? That's always a tricky one. But yeah. Yeah, so when you automatically create tickets, how do you handle false positives? We handled the same way that we did before. Um, if the developer felt there was a there was a false positive, they would they would you know they would raise it. Uh, I mean, they'd type something in there and they would you know tag me or tag somebody on my team, say, hey, what do you think about this? I think you know it's assuming untrusted data when it's actually trusted. You know, they would do the same thing. They were just doing it in a different place. They were doing it in Jira where they do all their other work, as opposed to doing it in our um, analysis platform. So same same process, just different tool. All right, I'm going to wrap up with uh, some conclusions and takeaways here, and then we'll be done. So um, I didn't know the mix that was going to be in a room. So I do, I do this talk for security people, and I've also done it for completely development audiences, and I give them different advice at the end because obviously it's a different audience. Um, because I didn't know what the mix was going to be here, you get both. So you get the developer advice on this side, you get the security person's uh, advice on this side. And if you're kind of a mixture, then take both. So developers, um, well, let's start with security people. Learn the development tools and processes. Don't add another system for them to use. Like, if they use Jira, use Jira. If they use Rally, use Rally. If they use whatever, like, figure out how to do your stuff 
in the confines of what they're already using. And um, from a development standpoint, help them. Like, they don't know your tools. If they have a question about, you know, oh, could we, is it possible to, you know, do a label thing here, or how can we do a dashboard? For, like, help them do that so that you can um, not have to learn more tools. It's in everybody's best interest. Take the existing stuff you have, the existing way you do things, and augment wherever you can. For developers, view security as quality. Um, sort of take a risk-based approach. Not everything is critical, which is the, sort of the same thing that I say to security people, which is security bugs are just bugs. Some of them can be high priority, but they're just bugs. You can treat them as bugs. And be reasonable. Not everything is critical. Don't, you know, don't throw a fit for every little thing. Uh, it's not going to help you gain credibility with the, with, the, with the dev team that you're working with. If you're a developer and you don't understand what's going on, ask lots of questions. Um, expect the security team to be super responsive about everything. Um, and make sure they understand why. I mean, Agile is not always second nature to security people, so they need to understand. Like, we do things quickly. We expect quick responses. We, you know, this is, we can't be blocked. You know, that sort of thing. And for security teams, communicate, just over-communicate. Communicate way more than you need to. Be insanely responsive to developer needs, even though that seems maybe, I don't know, maybe hard. Uh, but as you're trying to build support for bringing security into something, uh, and it's inevitably going to be viewed as more work, like, be really responsive. Be over-communicative. That really works well. Um, trust me. Learn the hard way. Developers, be flexible. We talked about the... the, the um, battle between scrum rigor and pragmatism. Accept the fact that you may not be able to have somebody embedded on your team and try to be understanding of that. And from a security perspective, have a little empathy, understand that, you know, how developers work and why they work and how they're motivated. Um, understanding uh, the scrum process really well uh, helps, helps with that. But just, you know, put yourself in their shoes for a little bit. And as you're asking them to do stuff, um, just, just remember, just have empathy. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Developers, remember that you're on the same team, you know, you work for the same company, presumably, as the, as the security team. They're not there to get in the way. They don't like being the bad guy. They don't, they just want to ship secure products. Um, assume that everything is a conversation that you, you know, under, you know, you should understand why they're telling you to fix something. If you don't understand, ask. Um, learn a little bit about the security vocabulary. Understand, you know, what happens when a SQL injection is exploited. Understand the impact. Um, and then for security people, don't just say no to everything. Um, figure out how to say yes. It's your job not to shut things down, but it's your job to help the dev teams innovate in a secure way. So don't uh, strengthen that perception that security is just there to get in the way. Just, you know, Raise above that, do what you can to help them go fast. Um, they care about security, but they also care about scalability and maintainability and usability and performance and deadlines and other things. And the last one is just the same for both. If you go back to the tenets, the main tenets of Scrum, it's, it's always be evaluating what you're doing and finding ways to get better. So customize the approach. Nobody's going to be able to go back and take even our most recent phase of what we're doing here and apply it to your to your companies. You, you're going to have to customize that to specific you know teams and the products that they're building. But always be evaluating. Always be trying to figure out what you can do better and how you customize that to how your organization works is going to be important. So Scrum is all about constant reevaluation. Um, so that's it. I hope you take away from this that security can work alongside Agile, can be done pretty effectively, and um, you know, build a partnership. Whichever side you're on, build a partnership. Remember you're on the same team, and, and hopefully that way security doesn't get left behind. Thank you.